Good afternoon, everyone. Oh my goodness, I can't believe all of you are here. <laughs> this morning when I was frantically calling neighbors to get them to push my car out of the driveway of the parking lot at my building, I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe we're going through with this. But this is Chicago, right? And we are Chicagoans. And we're here, and we're so grateful that all of you are here with us. Um, this is the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture's annual public lecture featuring Dr. Cornell West. I'm Tracy Matthews. I'm the Associate Director of the Center. Uh, each year, our annual public lecture features a leading scholar, activist, or artist whose work helps us to think and act critically on matters of race as they impact our various communities and intersect with our multiple identities. Last year, we hosted Danny Glover, and the year before that, we hosted scholar activist Angela Davis. And this year, we are so grateful to Dr. West for leaving 73 degree weather in Oakland, California, and changing his flight plans and getting on a red eye flight last night so he could be here bright and early this morning to join us. So thank you, Dr. West. So as we all know, major events like this can't happen without a lot of partnerships and support. So I'd like to thank our partners in this endeavor, the Office of Civic Engagement's U Chicago Engages series, Seminary Co-op Bookstore, and Beacon Press. I'd also like to thank Can TV for videotaping today's program for later Cablecast. And I want to also thank all of our volunteers, uh, the facilities and security staff, our photographers, for their hard work that they're doing right now today and that they did to make this happen. And I want to give a very special thank you to a few people, Dara Epison from the Race Center and Eden Sabala and Matthew Dean from Rockefeller Chapel. We couldn't have done this without them, so please give them a hand. <clears throat> We'd like to encourage everyone to live tweet the event using the hashtag CornellUshy, that's C-O-R-N-E-L-U-C-H-I. I thought about all the unknown foot soldiers of the civil rights movement whose blood, sweat, tears, and leadership made it possible to have a figure like Dr. King rise to prominence, especially leaders like Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and the young people in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Today, we're at a critical and historic juncture. People are in the streets because of the unfortunate necessity that we have to remind others, and sometimes ourselves, that black lives matter. So today, we've invited one of our current generation of young leaders to come to the stage to introduce Dr. West, Charlene Carruthers. Charlene is a political organizer and writer with over 10 years experience in racial justice, feminist, and youth leadership development movement work. Her passion for developing young leaders has led her to work on immigrant rights, economic justice, and civil rights campaigns nationwide. She's led grassroots and digital strategy campaigns for national progressive organizations, including the Center for Community Change, the Women's Media Center, colorofchange.org, and National People's Action. She earned her BA in History and International Studies from Illinois Wesleyan University and a Master's in Social Work from Washington University in St. Louis. And Charlene was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, where she currently resides. Join me in welcoming Charlene Carruthers. Good afternoon. I am absolutely uh, honored and I feel blessed to be able to be a part of this uh, event this afternoon and would like to thank all of you for showing up in this weather and braving it like true Chicagoans. I um, also wanna, would like to thank Tracy Matthews for such a gracious uh, invitation and opportunity. And before I share uh, all of Dr. West's uh, accolades, I wanna share a, a quick story that I learned from my sister and comrade Ashley Yates 
who is one of the most amazing young leaders and organizers in Ferguson. Ashley told me when Dr. West came to Ferguson uh, during Ferguson October weekend, uh, there were lots of cameras, right, as you can imagine. And everyone wanted to talk to Dr. West because Dr. West came in there just blazing, like ready to just get, get, like, get down nitty gritty with the young people who were the reason why everyone was even showing up and why everyone even knew about Ferguson, right? And so cameras, there was this one particular interview with CNN, and they only, they, uh, they wanted to talk to Dr. West. And he said, well, I'm not talking without the young people. This is what Ashley told me. He's like, I'm not talking without the young people. I will talk to you if Ashley comes with me. And so, you know, lots of people, they're just, it's just rhetoric when they talk about supporting young people. And so in the tradition of Ella Baker, Dr. West brought Ashley with him. And each time the cameras tried to divert the attention only to Dr. West and not and just completely ignore Ashley, he brought Ashley into the conversation. He's like, no, you need to talk to Ashley. Any question, he pointed to Ashley. Well, what's going on? Oh, well, Ashley, talk to Ashley every single time. And that, that is action, that's, that's words in action, values in action, and that's what Dr. West is about, right? Lots of people talk the talk, but Dr. West actually walks the walk, right? So, what you also must know about Dr. West, if you don't know, is that he's a prominent and provocative democratic intellectual. Provocative to, to say the least, right? A current professor at Union Theological Seminary, he has also taught at Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. He is the recipient of more than 20 honorary degrees. He is the author of 20 books, including Race Matters, Democracy Matters, The Memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud, and most recently, Black Prophetic Fire. He appears frequently on Real Time with Bill Maher, The Colbert Report, Democracy Now!, CNN, C-SPAN, and other national and international media. He lives in New York City. Wes will discuss his new book, The Radical King, an edited anthology of Martin Luther King Jr.'s writings. Wes highlights King's anti-war stance, his defense of the poor, his support of labor movements, and his opposition to global imperialism as evidence that King was, far, was a far more radical figure than it is acknowledged today. The book, this book, unearths a radical king that we can no longer sanitize, Wes writes. So please, please join me in a beautiful round of applause for Dr. Cornell West. <laughs> what a blessing to be here, University of Chicago, Rockefeller Chapel on the south side of Chicago. Oh, how blessed I am, my dear sister Charlene Crothers. I want to thank her, not just for those kind words, but I want to thank her for her leadership, building on the rich legacy of the inimitable Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and so many others. And of course, when I think of the Black Youth 100 Project, I think of the inimitable Professor Kathy Cohen. Give it up for Professor Cohen. What high quality combination of intellectual engagement and always focus on what's happening on the street. I want to thank Sister Tracy Matthews for facilitating my coming. She's been so wonderful with both the staff here at the chapel as well as the center. I want you to send my love and respect to my dear brother Michael Dawson. I'm told he just got back from the Big Apple and he's feeling under the weather. So I'm praying for him. Because even as a Jesus-loving, free black man, my prayers don't always connect, but it's the aspiration and it's the intention and motivation. So I know he's going to bounce back strong. Give it up for Professor Michael Dawson and Sister Tracy Matthews. Indeed, indeed. I see one of my favorite people in the world, and Professor Matthew Briones and Sister Candace and Sister... Ella West, and she's her daughter's named after Ella Baker, and a Negro named Cornell. And that's a hell of a combination. Stand up, all three of you all, stand up. All three of you stand up. Give it up, give it up for the three. Distinguished Professor Matthew Briones. He's my teaching fellow at Harvard University years ago, strong as ever. And I see Brother Bill Ayers and Sister Bernadette Dawn. Love you all. Give it up for both of them. Give it up for both of them. 
Long distance runners still holding up that bloodstained banner for justice. I got my beacon folk here with Sister Pam, Brother Tom. It's good to see you. I know Brother Nate is here somewhere. He's my dear brother. Where's Brother Nate? Where's Brother Nate? Stand up, Brother Nate. He's standing somewhere. <laughs> Brother Dwight, and I think each and every one of you for coming out today. I did believe that when I arrived this morning that there would be about 12 of us. <laughs> but that's all right. Because I'll say exactly the same thing about my dear brother Martin Luther King Jr. That when I hear his name, I just shake and tremble and shiver and quiver. Why? Because he exemplifies such high levels of courage and vision, service to others, finding joy in serving others, and sacrifice. When you think of Martin, just think of him in that paddy wagon in the dark with a German shepherd four and a half hours biting at him the same amount of time as our dear brother Michael Brown's body lay on that street in Ferguson. And I talked to Andy Young, and he said, Brother Wes, when Martin stepped out of that paddy wagon, it was just me and Daddy King. He said, it looked as if he'd had a nervous breakdown. He could not walk straight. And he had one sentence on his lips. He said, this is the cross we must bear for the freedom of our people. I see that's love concretized. That's love exemplified. That's love enacted. And Martin Luther King Jr. is in no way an isolated individual to be put on a pedestal for us to be spectators to look at him as if he's part of a museum piece. He's part of a tradition. He is a wave in an ocean. And we're here to ensure that never again can he be deodorized. We're going to keep it funky. <laughs> oh, yes. Martin King was a funk master. Because he knew the fundamental question as always, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creature born between urine and feces? It's who we are. We all emerge in the funk, the love push that got us out. And we're not here that long. One day our bodies will be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's funky too. And the question is, who are you going to be in that short time between womb and tomb? And Martin Luther King Jr. would be the first to say, always situate me, contextualize me, humanize me in relation to those who came before. Because I know you would agree with me. I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. Somebody attended to me. The highest status I'll ever have is to be the second son of the late Clifton and the present Irene and to be a product of Shiloh Baptist Church on the ch chocolate side of Sacramento, California. All that love coming at me from Reverend Willie P. Cook and Deacon Hinton and Sarah Ray, Sunday school and vacation Bible school teacher. I didn't need to get to Harvard and Princeton to understand what it means to wrestle with, with my humanity. What Martin King comes out of, Alberta Williams King, her womb, PK, preacher's kid, Mary's daddy king, shaped by that precious family, brother A.D., sister Christine, distinguished professor Spellman, just retired a few months ago. Morehouse College, every time we say the word Morehouse College, we ought to just be silent for a while. As they say, you can always tell a Morehouse man, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> Consecrated space for black struggle. Benjamin Mays, my God, 
University of Chicago PhD, alongside Sinclair Drake and other giants that allowed black folk to matriculate through this place, even given its own vicious legacy of white supremacy. Still operating, but making movement. And then on the Crozier Theological Seminary with the white teachers who took him seriously, so seriously that he could be wrong as well as right, and on to Boston University and writing that magnificent dissertation on Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wyman. Wyman, another professor, University of Chicago Divinity School. Martin Luther King Jr. wave in an ocean. He's part and parcel of what the Isley brothers call a caravan of love because Martin Luther King Jr. was somebody who had the courage to say, I could choose to be part of this tradition of a people who've been terrorized and traumatized and stigmatized for 400 years, but still choose love of truth and love of justice and love of neighbor. And for Brother Martin, it was even love of enemy. You don't try that one on your own. You're going to need some thick grace for that. But it's a tradition that talks explicitly about love and how magnificent it is that black people, one of the most, if not the most hated people in the modern world, dish out figures like John Coltrane, Love Supreme, Nina Simone, Mississippi, Goddamn, Curtis Mayfield, the love train of people get ready, that gentle genius from the west side of Chicago. Martin King is part of that wave, y'all. He's not here to be elevated into being some deity of God. He's a human being who was deeply loved and he chose to be part of that caravan of love. And he understood it as the way of the cross. He's not first and foremost a civil rights activist. He's first and foremost a free black man who decided to make Jesus his choice and believed that the kingdom of God was to be understood as the beloved community. And he heard every year, if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. I mean, he was convinced that to be human was to spread what our Jewish brothers and sisters call hesed, loving kindness to the orphan, to the widow, to the fatherless, to the motherless, to the poor, to working people, to the prisoners. We can go on and on to our gay brothers and lesbian sisters, to our indigenous brothers and sisters, to the Dalit brothers and sisters in India, to Palestinian brothers and sisters under Israeli occupation, those in Tibet dealing with Chinese occupation, Kurds dealing with Iraqi occupation, all the folk who are subordinated dominated, exploited, they have a priority in the tradition that Martin Luther King Jr. learned at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Now we know of course that Christians have no monopoly on this. Given the Christian vicious history of atrocities and barbarities and bestialities against other folk, be they Jews or Muslims or agnostics or a whole host of others. No doubt about that. Martin understood that very well, but he still decided to choose the way of the cross. And by cross, he meant unarmed truth, unconditional love, and the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. Just like he would say over and over again, justice is what love looks like in public. And I would add, tenderness is what love feels like in private. Because Martin Luther King Jr. came from a black people who were fundamentally committed to a militant tenderness. What did Martin say about Malcolm X when, when he was shot? 
in Audubon room. Malcolm had such a sweet spirit. I was thinking about that in relation to my dear brother, Haki Mahabute, one of the legendary poets and educators, not just in Chicago, but in the whole country. Yes, give it up for brother Haki. He's a son of Malcolm X. But he and Malcolm have a tenderness and a sweetness. Martin understood that. I try to remind young folk these days, when I hear him talking about, say my name, say my name. No, Otis Redden said, try a little tenderness. <laughs> and we're going to get to that, this spiritual and cultural war on the black youth. Ferguson is one response, but it's not just political. It's not just arbitrary policing. It has to do with the low quality of music and the inability to gain access to structures of feeling and value that allow you to straighten your back up and understand what it is to be a promoter of militant tenderness. Black folk wouldn't be who we are. We couldn't straighten our backs up. We couldn't tell the truth, bear witness if we didn't have tenderness coming our way, not just in terms of touch and hug, but also in terms of patience to generate self-respect and generate self confidence, that's the threat all the time for the status quo, because black rage, when channeled through love and justice, always makes the elite, the oligarchs and plutocrats tremble in their boots, because they know the history of these people, oh Lord, they've known every kind of terrorism, every kind of trauma, every kind of stigma. When they wake up, when they straighten their backs up, lo and behold, something is going on. Something is happening. As Martin used to say, anytime those Sly Stone called everyday people straighten their backs up, they're going somewhere because folk can't ride your back unless it's bent. And the history of black people is what? A history in which folk has attempted to be niggerized. Teach them they're less moral. Teach them they're less beautiful. Teach them they're less intelligent. Teach them to be so afraid and intimidated and, and scared that they walk around laughing when it ain't funny and scratching when it don't itch. And wearing the mask just to get over, to gain access to middle class status. But if it's just a matter of being successful and still adjusted, well adjusted to injustice, you're still suffering from a spiritual malnutrition and emptiness of the soul. Now, I just saw my dear brother Flager walk in. Where's brother Flager? There he is. Give it up for brother Father Flager. He's my dear brother. Love this brother deeply. St. Sabina in the house. St. Sabina in the house. Be there at the end of February. Indeed, indeed. He understands, as a vanilla brother, he's in the business <laughs> of myself and others of trying to denigerize black people to take the fear out of them. Quit being so afraid and intimidated. Straighten your back up, tell the truth, bear witness, take a risk. And this is true for the black professional class. It's been re -niggerized. You got folk with big houses and big mansions and big cars and they still scared, they still intimidated, they still afraid to tell the truth. <laughs> if Martin came back, he said, oh, look at all of these highly successful folk I want to know what they're faithful to. Don't tell me about your success. Tell me how you're using your success. That's Martin Luther King Jr. It's true. It's going to generate a whole wave of peacocks. Look at me. Look at me. I'm the first black this. I'm the first brown that. And I could hear Martin say, peacocks strut because they can't fly. I want to know what is the quality of your service to the least of these echoes of the 25th chapter of Matthew. That's Martin Luther King Jr. And let us be very, very clear that when Martin Luther King Jr. died, 72% of Americans disapproved of him, 55% of black people disapproved of him. So everybody loves him now that the worms got his body, but he, when he was alive, people were afraid of him. Why? Because his love was so deep. And anytime you love folk, you hate the fact they're being treated unjustly. You loathe the fact they're being treated unfairly. And if you don't say something, the rocks are going to cry out. And Martin is not by himself. He had Stokely Carmichael there. 
the Trinidadian brother, pushing him. Nobody likes Stokely when it comes to a love affair with black people. Martin and Stokely like wet on water. He disagreed, especially on the God quest. Stokely was a secular brother like Richard Wright and so many other the great black secular thinkers. But they came together in terms of not being afraid. One way of trying to keep track of Martin Luther King Jr.'s connection to the movement, the ways in which the movement made him and the ways in which he helped make the movement, they go hand in hand, is his response to the four questions of the greatest public intellectual in the history of the American empire. I'm talking about W.E.B. Du Bois. 1957. Du Bois had just emerged from a U.S. court in handcuffs, taking his passport, got him under house arrest. He's able to visit only one other black brother who's also under house arrest in Philadelphia named the great Paul Robes. And they would sit, the professor and the pupil, in the recent book, talks about their conversations. Du Bois says, I want to pass on love letters to the younger generation just like we're trying to pass on love letters to the Ferguson generation. He says, keep this legacy alive. He says, but there's four questions I've been wrestling with all of my life. And in that first novel, The Ordeal of Manzart, you turn to page 275. What do you see? He said, the first question, how shall integrity meet oppression? integrity the great history of black people in america is what in the face of terror trauma and stigma we aspire at our best to integrity even if we're defeated momentarily we'd rather go down with our integrity than win and be a gangster like those who gangsterize us <laughs> integrity the second question what does honest to do in the face of deception. Because white supremacy is nothing but a lie, it's a vicious lie, but it lives in every nook and cranny of American life, and it's a global phenomenon, be even beyond national boundaries. Can you be honest about it? That's what James Baldwin says in that last line of the preface, the notes of a native son, all I want to be is a writer and an honest man. And of course, the highest expression voice of a David Ruffin, or Wanda or Sheila Hutchinson of the emotions uh, of the Dales, the mighty Dales. What do you hear in those voices? Integrity, honesty, vulnerability, power, strength. They're not just entertainers. Their love warriors, too, is expressed in an artistic way in the same way Martin King and Malcolm X and Fannie Lou Hamer were love warriors expressed in a political and social way. But they're all interconnected and intertwined. Third question, what does decency do in the face of insult? In the last one, how does virtue meet brute force? Keep track of all four of those and think about Martin Luther King Jr. and the tradition that produced him. A people, a despised, dishonored, devalued people mustering the courage to attempt to live lives of integrity, honesty, decency, and a sense of virtue in face of oppression Deception lies mendacity in face of insult, assault, attack, psychic, physical, political, and then brute force, repression, crushed, incarcerated, maimed, on parole, on probation, the repressive apparatus of the nation state coming at you in a raw and coarse way. One of the things we love about Martin is what? That he was willing to stand up in the face of that raw repressive apparatus. Well, 
Beginning in January 1956, every day the FBI had him under surveillance. We find out that his photographer who took on over 10,000 pictures of him was an FBI informant too. Martin, how you doing, brother? It's about the love, brother West. It's about the love, University of Chicago, Rockefeller Chapel. Do you have what it takes to muster that kind of love of truth, love of justice, love of neighbor? I can't do it by myself. I got to be part of a tradition. I got to remember my grandmama. I got to connect with my father. I want to put a smile on my aunt's face. Memory, Sankofa. Refuse to look forward until you look back and understand what is the wind at your back? Who you gonna really be faithful to? Are you just tied to your own egocentric predicament or do you understand yourself as somehow being able to muster this kind of courage because somebody else did it before you? That's what we love about Mark. And that's what makes it so difficult to come to terms with it, especially these days. Because we don't live in an age of integrity, we live in an age of cupidity. It's love of money. Wu-Tang Clan is right, it's cream. Cash rules everything around me, but it doesn't have to rule me, it's around me. But it's all about our Benjamins. Everybody for sale. Everything for sale. Folk highly talented, they just want to be smart with dollars. They don't want to be wise with compassion. One of the highest things you can say about young folk these days, they so smart. I could hear Martin say, I'm not impressed. I knew smart Nazis. I knew smart white supremacists. I knew smart homophobes. I knew smart patriarchs. I don't want just smartness. I want some wisdom and some compassion and some willingness to sacrifice. That's something different. Not impressed. Don't tell me how many dollars you got. So what you got so many dollars? What focus do you have? What are your priorities in life? What kind of human being are you? That's the tradition that produced Martin. He knew when Malcolm was shot, he only had $151 in his pocket. That's all he owned. So what? We'll always remember Malcolm X because of the depth of his love. Even when the white mainstream says he was a hater. No, he was hating the treatment of black people. That brother had a love in him that cut so deep we don't have a language for it. That's why Martin and Martin, Malcolm and Martin go hand in hand. June the 27th, 1964, Malcolm X receives a message from Martin Luther King Jr. How do we know? FBI files. You understand, Brother Bill? Oh, the FBI got history of all of us. It's a compliment. <laughs> the recent book by William Maxwell on the ghost readers of J. Edgar Hoover, how it framed African-American lit literature because they got 1,200 pages on Baldwin, 1,004 pages on Lorraine Hansberry. They got dissertations written on black novels in the FBI. Some of them doing more work than professors. <laughs> Why? Because they know it's a threat. Especially the Lorraine Hansberrys and the James Baldwins. We won't get into some of the other writers who capitulated and some of them sold their souls for a mess of pottage just to be accepted by a white mainstream that still viewed them as exotic objects rather than human beings. Even when you're embraced, if you're not respected, there's a problem, and if you think you're respected, but they disrespected Jamal and Letitia on the block, you better get off the symbolic crack pipe and come to your senses. So there's not just a matter of the exceptional Negroes at the top breaking the glass ceiling when too many locked in the basement still. Socially neglected, economically abandoned. And that's precisely that Martin's response to Du Bois' questions would be, here in this particular moment, in the age of our dear brother Obama, when I got a ride today from the taxi, I said, I'm going to the Hyatt on the south side. And my dear brother said, oh, that's the president's 
neighborhood. I said I could never tell based on his priorities. I could never tell. Wall Street's doing well, stock market breaking record, hedge bank, hedge fund investors break dancing to the bank. <laughs> Poverty rates increase, schools still decrepit, militarized, no arts program, so when they get there, they can't learn to play the instruments, so you're not gonna get no Ohio players, you're not gonna get Charles Watts, 103rd Street Rhythm Band, you're not gonna get James Brown's band, they got to use computers because they can't play the instruments. And some of their singers will make millions of dollars and can't sing in tune. Because it's not a matter of getting it right, it's a matter of image, it's PR, it's part of the culture of superficial spectacle. You just want to get over by any means. You're not concerned about integrity, you're just concerned about cupidity because you turn, you tied to the same oligarchs and plutocrats who run radio, video, recording, and live performance, and all they want is to use you as a means by which they make big money as if your tradition is disposable. I can't stand it. I don't know about you. I can't stand it. And we wonder why the young folk don't have groups like the Delphonics or the Dramatics or Enchantment or the Jones Girls or the Marvelettes or the Temptations where you have to cultivate your craft, lift your voice, blend it with other voices and try to stir people's souls, not just stimulate their bodies. Oh, I'm in Chicago. This is soul-stirring country. Lou Rawls, Johnny Taylor, Sam Cooke, my God. All of these rich, deep, magnificent Mississippi Negroes came up here and transformed this city with the blue sensibilities of geniuses like B.B. King and so many others. Let's just be honest about it. The Martin Luther King Jr., blues man, because the blues is fundamentally about catastrophe. When the king of the blues, B.B. King says, nobody loves me but my mama and she might be jiving too. <laughs> That's catastrophic. <laughs> That's like Sophocles' Antigone in the classic of our Greek brothers and sisters. Cat catastrophic. Martin Luther King Jr. would be concerned about ecological catastrophe, impending, driven by corporate greed and sense of domination. Martin Luther King Jr. would be concerned about impending nuclear catastrophe. We still got 17,500 nuclear warheads. Russia still got over 10,000. He'd be concerned about xenophobia in whatever form. That's a moral catastrophe. It could be white supremacy. It could be anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Arab hatred, anti-Muslim hatred, and especially these days, our Muslim brothers and sisters who are often cast in such a way that ISIS and Al-Qaeda somehow speaks for all of them. What a lie, what a lie, what a lie. Yes, we got to keep track of gangsters. We have gangsters in all of our communities. Martin Luther King Jr. would say over and over again, sinner that I am, he understands that he's wrestling with something inside of him. And I know I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> Nothing but the Holy Ghost holding me together. You see me doing something ungodly. I told you so already. Pray for me. I got bounced back. Try again, fell again, fail better, as Samuel Beckett puts it. Try again, fell again, fail better. All of us gonna die. Failures when our bodies are in the coffin. The question is, how good was our failure? If all of us fall short. I know I got my dear sister Tamika too, Bethel here, coming out of Yale, south side of Chicago. Magnificent, young, visionary, intellectual activist, very much like Charlotte's group. Younger generation, 
be long distance runners, which means you have to be blues women and blues men. And I'm not talking about entertainers. I'm talking about being on intimate terms with catastrophe, but just like B.B. King when he sings that song, he got a smile on his face. Where does that smile come from? He got a joy that cuts so deep that it's qualitatively different than pleasure. So much of American culture is just a joyless quest for pleasure, insatiable pleasure, but no real joy that cuts deep, that can sustain you in the midst of a catastrophe. Not at all. And he's got a little help from Lucille, his guitar. But there's a connection between Lucille, that guitar, and what he heard in the genius named Robert Johnson in the Delta, or Muddy Waters. It's part of a tradition. He's not out there all by himself. He's trying to sustain the highest standards that have been bequeathed to him by those who came before. We may not know about him. White mainstream may not know about him. So what? They are still part of our memories. They're anonymous. They're nameless folk who helped cultivate our sense of self-respect and self-confidence. That's what you hear when you please plan that Lucille. And then the same love flowing out of his soul, going straight to all other people's souls who are open, no matter what color, gender, sexual orientation. It is a human thing all the way down. Martin, blues man. What do we do these days with Martin? Well, think, for example, the moment when Martin comes out against the war based on the magnificent love and pressure of Stokely Carmichael and so many others. Why? He says, because I believe Vietnamese babies have the same status as white babies or black babies or brown babies. And he learned in vacation Bible school. Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. He was fundamentalist about that. It would be nice if fundamentalist Christians were more fundamentalist about love thy neighbor. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Martin was that kind of fundamentalist. But then he wanted to organize poor people across the board. And not just bring them all together. What was he going to do? Shut Washington down. Shut it down. You're not going to operate. He said the government was a conspiracy against the poor, and poor people for so long have been neglected. Got him in a lot of trouble. When Whitney Young walked up to him and said, Martin, you setting back the black freedom movement a generation. You're moving from civil rights to something you don't know nothing about. And Martin was nonviolent, but I'm sure he almost slapped him upside the head. And to hold me back with Joe Frazier on him, right there on the spot. And Ralph had to hold him. He said, Brother Whitney, what you say may get you big money from a foundation grant, a corporation, but it won't get you a foothold in the kingdom of truth. Now that can be said for much of our leadership in America. You say what you have to say in order to keep your job and career and downplay your calling and the truth because you need your money flow and the kingdom of truth is something you hold at arm's length. Don't you know that chickens come home to roost? Don't you know you're going to reap what you sow? Don't you know that truth crushed the earth will rise again? What makes you think that somehow life is just a matter of short term pecuniary gain obsessed with chasing dollars and has nothing to do with integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue that Du Bois was talking about. Martin was a towering figure in part because he would never sell out. Never. Malcolm too. Fannie Lou too. Curtis Mayfield too. John Coltrane sat on the third row listening to Malcolm X. Every time he came to New York, the agent said, stay away from Malcolm. Stay away from Malcolm. You're playing my favorite things. That's Rodgers and Hammerstein. You got a bestseller. You better hold on to that, John. He said, you don't understand who I am. I'm John Coltrane from Gut Bucket, Jim Crow, North Carolina. Come out of Reverend Blair. I'm somebody trying to be honest with my sound. 
And sometimes, as he did November 11th, 1966, Coltrane did what? He threw his horn down. He started singing. Then he stopped singing. What did he do? He beat on his chest. Rashid Ali said, Train, what's happening? He said, I'm just trying to express myself, spread the love. And the horn got limitations. <laughs> That's what Ashton and Simpson called the real thing, y'all. It's not God, it's not an attribute of God, it's a human quality. It's still fallen and finite, but it's the real thing. The younger generation, Ferguson, Staten Island, hungry for the real thing. They tired of superficiality. We can march all we want, hands up, hands up, magnificent, magnificent. But how in the world are we going to have a precious black a brown sister or brother shot every 28 days for the last seven years, got a black president, black attorney general, black homeland security cabinet, and can't get one federal prosecution of a policeman shooting down Jamal or Letitia or Juan or Juanita. What in the world is going on? What's happening? What is going on? I call it a that's a key sweat moment. Something, something just ain't right. And you point it out and say, oh, Brother West, you hating. You had no, I ain't hating. If you're in tight with Wall Street, that's your choice. If you choose drones to drop bombs on innocent people, 233 children counting and a baby in Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, or Afghanistan have exactly the same value as a white baby in Newtown, Connecticut, or a brown baby on the in East Los Angeles or a black baby in the south side of Chicago. Those are choices people make. If you got massive surveillance keeping track of people's phones, if you already assassinated four Americans with no judicial review, no accountability whatsoever, those are choices. It's a question of integrity, honesty, decency, of virtue. I don't care what color you are. That's not hating on a person. That's hating injustice. Martin Luther King Jr. was a hater of injustice because he had love in his heart. That's the challenge, especially for the younger generation. It's going to be up to you to make sure that your rage is filtered through love and justice and not hatred and revenge. Much of human history is a cycle of hatred and revenge and domination and oppression. I don't care what color you are, what culture, what sexual orientation, or what civilization you are. The question is how do you create a disruption and interruption of it to create some spaces so that the dignity of those Martin love, those Malcolm love, those Fannie Lou love. There's a dear sister, one of the great freedom fighters of the 20th century, her name is Dorothy Day. She's a vanilla Catholic sister. She, won, she wrote one of the great eulogies of Martin Luther King Jr. Go back and look at the Catholic worker, April 5th, 1968. She said, Brother Martin learned how to die daily because he knew that love is a form of death. That any time you muster the courage to love the truth, you're going to have to examine some assumptions and presuppositions. You're going to have to let some of them go. You're going to have to examine your prejudices and prejudgments. You're going to have to let them go. And when you let those go, that is a form of death. There is no rebirth without death. There is no maturation, development, or growth without you learning how to die in order to learn how to live. The Christian New Testament says what? Christians must die daily. That's what Paul says. Paul's not right about everything, but my God, he got that one right. That Roman citizen of a vicious empire called the Roman Empire. Brother Paul got that one right. That Jewish brother got that thing right. Because black people, we have been on intimate terms with death. The social death of slavery for 244 years. Just a commodity to be bought and sold. 
the civic death of Jim and Jane Crow Senior. We still got Jim and Jane Crow Jr. operating, prison industrial complex, segregated schools, segregated neighborhoods, segregated cultural lives. Jim Crow's still alive. Michelle Alexander got it right. She's got it right now. But to be on intimate terms with death and then our blues tradition to say we're going to not terrorize others because we're being terrorized, we're going to fight for freedom for everybody. See, we're not going to Jim Crow somebody else just because we Jim Crow. We want liberty for everybody. You see, we're not going to hate in response to hate. No, that's Martin. And even love your enemies but that I take very seriously as a Christian myself. The fact that, yes, the gangsters and the thugs, often in high places, Criminals on Wall Street, market manipulation, insider trading, fraudulent activity, not one of them go to jail. But let a poor person get caught with a crack bag, go straight to jail. My God, how it's criminal. But loving your enemies to make sure you never freeze anybody in one space so that you trump their future, that you foreclose their sense of growth and possibility. Malcolm Little was a gangster. Elijah loved him into becoming Malcolm X. If he did not focus on that Malcolm Little, he would have died a gangster in a prison. It was the love that transformed him. And later on, he went beyond Elijah, didn't he? But that's part of the love on the chocolate side of town, that kind of love has very little status in the history of white America. We can see it in the film Selma. For the first time, you have portrayed in the mainstream theater, mainstream film, black humanity, creativity, organizing, mobilizing. It doesn't get everything right. I think it's wrong about SNCC, but okay, you can see the beauty of the black folk coming together and the dialogue ends up about what? LBJ. Because white fears, white anxieties, white interests always center the dialogue. What are they saying about me? It ain't about you. It ain't about you. It's about these black folk coming together. And when you have folk like Bill and Bernadette that say, you know what? We from the vanilla side of town. We're going to join the movement. We're not going to be allies to the movement. We're freedom fighters in our own right. We coming with other freedom fighters. We're going to sing with, with Bernice Reagan. We're going to sing with Curtis Mayfield. We a winner. Because when Curtis was talking about we a winner, when he's talking about the love trade, that's a human choice you make. You're not doing black folk a favor somehow by pitching in and fighting for black freedom. It's your definition of what you conceive yourself to be as a human being. That's what Martin was talking about. How difficult it is. And yet at the same time, we do live in many ways in a different kind of society, in some ways better, in some ways worse. And Martin would be the first to say, be prisoners of hope. Don't be cheap optimists. Or you'll run out of gas, you won't be a long distance runner. You come out of the block strong, get to the second lap, and no more gas in your tank. But certainly don't be a pessimist. Because one of the things the blues has nothing to do with is pessimism. I've been down so long that down don't worry me no more. That's why I keep keeping on. That's not pessimism. That's a realism about the catastrophe and the darkness and the willingness to keep on pushing with your integrity, with your honesty, with your decency, with your virtue. Thank you so much, Brother Martin, we love you. Brother Martin, we need you. What a beautiful thing. God bless you all. Thank you.